by work that we're doing on Starshot that you heard about earlier. Um, I'd like to contrast two different types of missions to illustrate a point. One type of mission is the launch landing type mission where we uh, launch a rocket, accelerate it for some period of time, and then decelerate it and land. And once we've landed, we do scientific data collection and transmission back to Earth, uh, and we get light propagation back. That's one type of mission, and a very different kind of mission is the one that we envision in uh, something like Starshot, which is uh, launching a spacecraft or a probe, we call it. Spacecraft is uh, kind of uh, uh, a little bit optimistic, a probe, which uh, using uh, directed energy acceleration, uh, so we have a short acceleration cycle, then we have a ballistic cruise cycle where the uh, probe is influenced only by gravity. Uh, then we have scientific uh, data collection as the probe passes uh, uh, Alpha Centauri or uh, some other star system. And after that, we transmit the data back while the, the um, probe is still in a ballistic um, cruise mode. And so then we have abandonment of the spacecraft at the end of transmission and light propagation back for getting the data back to Earth. The um, thesis I'm going to uh, talk about is that uh, the requirements of these two different kinds of missions are very different with regard to speed of the probe or the spacecraft. In particular, in the launch landing mission, there's a strong argument for maximizing the speed of the, of the spacecraft. Um, if nothing else, if we have a human crew aboard, then we would like to minimize the elapsed time as measured by a clock on board the spacecraft, the proper time of the spacecraft. And the way to do that is to accelerate as much as possible and for as long as possible and go, in other words, go as fast as possible. And that's a pretty strong argument. In the case of the fly, flyby mission, I'm now going to argue that we should actually uh, go slower than we can under uh, cer some circumstances, uh, particularly as we want to increase the amount of data that we get back from the scientific investigation. Um, so the, the more general thesis, which I believe and I'd like to convince you of, is that we should look at the stakeholders for a mission. We should look at what their wants and needs are, and then we should um, carefully catalog the assumptions and when we do that, we may find that, in fact, we don't want to go as fast as we could go. Okay, so in terms of the uh, things, the stakeholders and what they care about, uh, this uh, plot captures that, the assumptions of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, the assumption is that the primary stakeholder is a science investigator who's collecting information in a flyby and wants to get that the data from that uh, flyby back to Earth reliably. Um, <clears throat> the uh, thesis is that that investigator cares only about two things, cares about the amount of data you get back and the latency with which you get it back. That is a time delay until you get the data back. What that investigator does not care about directly is the speed of the probe. And uh, except when you do the flyby, uh, the, the um, when you're in the vicinity of the target, the uh, science investigation would prefer if the probe was moving more slowly so that you're in that vicinity for a longer period of time. Other than that, the uh, investigator doesn't care about the speed of the probe. So on the horizontal axis, uh, and I'm going to repeat this plot about five or six times, so it's important to understand the axes, because these are the two metrics which I believe are important to the science investigator. Uh, one is on the horizontal axis is the total received energy on Earth that, we're, that the probe is able to get back to Earth. And this is a relative uh, measure here. Uh, the absolute depends upon a lot of factors like aperture sizes and the electrical power available in the probe and so forth. This is a relative axis. The total received energy reaching Earth, the way communications works, is proportional to the total volume of data that we can get back. So this is a stand-in, uh, an easy way to think about the amount of data that we get, 
can get back. So we are going over, this is a log scale, and we're going over uh, eight orders of magnitude on this horizontal axis, which would be equivalent to the difference between getting back 10 bits and one gigabit of data. On the vertical axis, we have the data latency in years uh, over a period from zero to 100 years or one century. The Data latency is defined as the time elapsed from the time the probe is launched until uh, the data is received back. And it's important that you appreciate that I'm defining latency in terms of the complete return of data, not some initial return of data. Uh, the reason I think that's important in this particular instance is that we're going to operate under extremes of energy efficiency and uh, so under, that, under those conditions, uh, I think it's, it's the case that uh, we will not be able to recover any of the data until we have the complete uh, transmission back from the spacecraft in hand. Uh, that is, we don't get any data without getting all of the data. Okay, so the, uh, with those two definitions in mind, and those are the two metrics that we're going to work with, uh, there is a feasibility region, a region where um, the uh, where we, it's possible to receive the data back with certain latency and a certain data volume. Uh, <clears throat> that region has a lower boundary, uh, which I call the efficient frontier. The efficient frontier is where we actually want to operate if we're doing the best job we can for the science investigator because uh, at the efficient frontier, um, we get the lowest latency possible for a given energy back to earth, or alternatively, we get the maximum energy for a given latency. And if we operate inside the feasibility region away from the efficient frontier, then we're not doing our best for the uh, science investigator. Okay, so the first uh, question you ask is how can we um, operate on the efficient frontier, uh, what variables do we modify uh, in particular to uh, move from the left to right? You could imagine that there'll be different requirements for different probes, that we're launching different probes with the same infrastructure on Earth, and uh, there will be different requirements for different probes. And two extremes might be, for example, the very first probe that we launch is an engineering evaluation as to whether the probe technology is working. And in that case, we want that evaluation information to come back as soon as feasible. And we are, do not have high ex expectations for the amount of data we're getting back. It's simply some minimal telemetry data like uh, A's working, B's working, C's working, everything survived the interstellar medium. Uh, as far as we know, we, we would be able to collect data if we had the appropriate uh, equipment on board. Uh, on the other hand, later in the evolution of the system, we could imagine that there's uh, some much more complex instrumentation that requires uh, large amounts of data coming back. And so we'd operate, we'd like to operate far to the right. And we would accept the larger latency that's inevitable if we get larger amounts of data back. Okay, so what happens if we take a single probe with a, a, a single uh, mass and speed. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna vary the mass and speed. So right now we're holding mass and speed constant. How do we move through this feasible region? Well, the variable that we can modify very easily is the uh, transmission time after encounter, the time until we uh, suspend transmission. Obviously, if we transmit longer, we'll get more data back. So that's one variable we can play with. So what I'm doing here is varying the transmission time uh, after encounter, and we get a curve like this. This curve only touches the efficient frontier at one point. Uh, so it is capable of achieving one point on the efficient frontier, but it's not capable of achieving any point on the efficient frontier uh, to meet the varying needs of different uh, probes. Um, so, to the left of the uh, tangent point to the efficient frontier, this particular uh, strategy uh, has a larger latency than is possible that is feasible. 
Uh, the reason for that is the time to target. The, the low latency is lower bounded by the time it takes the probe to reach the target. Um, to the right of the tangent point the, to the, of the efficient frontier, the, uh, pro, the probe is unable to get back nearly as much data as is possible. And the reason for that is distance squared loss the loss decreases with distance as the probe is moving uh, away from us after encounter. And that places an upper bound on the total amount of data that we can get back. Um, and in particular, it keeps us from getting anywhere near the efficient frontier in terms of data volume or energy. Energy is what we're plotting here. Uh, so if we want to get different uh, points on the efficient frontier, the way to do that is to vary the mass and speed of the probe. And so I've shown here uh, four cases where the probe has a unit mass, where the probe has a mass 10 times greater, 30 times greater, and 100 times greater than the nominal uh, one unit mass unit. Um, now, when we move to higher mass, uh, the probe slows down. And we'll talk about why, what that mechanism is in a moment. Um, but the curve moves up and it moves to the right. And the tangent point to the efficient frontier moves as we make that modification. So the way to achieve different points on the efficient frontier is not through varying the transmission time, but it's through varying the mass and speed of the probe. And in particular, if we wanna get more data back, we should uh, slow down the probe and increase its mass. Uh, now let's talk about, so larger mass, lower speed as we move to the right, higher data volumes. Let's talk about what the mechanisms are for these curves to move up and to the right. Um, for the curve to move up, the reason for that is as we increase the mass of the probe, we uh, reduce its speed. And in fact, the latency increases as the quarter power of the mass. Um, now, if we assume that we have a fixed launcher, which is launching many probes, um, and the only thing that's varying among the probes is their mass, then we would kind of expect that the latency would increase to the square root of mass because it would be constant kinetic energy. Constant kinetic energy would correspond to a uh, speed that's uh, uh, proportional to the mass, to the minus one fourth, or one half, I'm sorry, it's one over the square root. It's actually much more favorable than that. Uh, if we assume that we're operating in a diffraction limited, um, in a diffraction limited uh, uh, launching mechanism, we have a fixed beam, a fixed size of, uh, of uh, beamer. And as we increase the mass, we can increase the size of the sail. If we increase the size of the sail, we can also um, Redu uh, increase the acceleration time and thereby increase the, um, the kinetic energy that we impart to the probe. And so that's why it goes up as a quarter power. The curves move to the right. And the reason for that is, uh, has to do with the uh, one over distance squared loss that we were talking about earlier. Um, the uh, as the loss goes down as one distance squared, then we can, um, we suffer less loss over time if the probe is moving slower. And uh, we can also, uh, hy we hypothesize, we can also increase the uh, transmit power of the probe because we can increase the electrical power. We have more mass to work with for electric generation. We can increase the um, aperture area for the transmit aperture. And so together those uh, two things suggest that the uh, transmit power goes up as a square of the mass. So those are the two mechanisms that allow us further to the right, go further to the right. Now, um, what we notice is that for these different curves, the tangent point to the efficient frontier, which is the actually the uh, lower envelope of all these curves, 
that uh, point is about the same point in the trajectory at the transition between latency limit and energy limit. So it's not surprising that uh, there's a consistency uh, for different mass probes. In particular, I've shown uh, the curve of the transmission time equal to 10% of the travel time. Um, and as we vary the travel time due to changes in speed, the transmission time is 10% of that. And that falls very close to the efficient frontier. The other curves I've shown are 1%, 50%, and 100% of, of uh, travel time. Uh, just one more point. Uh, the, it is important to recognize that we are exchanging higher launch energy for larger energy back to Earth because we are accelerating the probe for a longer period of time. It turns out that that trade-off has large efficiencies of scale as indicated by this equation here. So uh, the takeaways, uh, the uh, time to increase the received energy or data volume, we should slow the probe. The slower probe also benefits scientific data collection, so that's good. Higher mass probe is easier to design and fabricate, arguably, uh, and efficiency. To achieve the maximum efficiency, we should have a transmission time that's consistently about 10% of the travel time under the assumptions that we've laid out. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions. The first question is, if you decrease speed and increase mass, what happens to cost? If, if you decrease speed and increase mass, what happens to cost? Well, we're, actu we're actually decreasing speed by increasing mass. And the main impact on cost is that the, uh, the Beamer infrastructure doesn't change. We're assuming that's fixed. However, we are going to be accelerating the spacecraft longer in order to get lower speed and higher mass. And uh, so there is a cost in terms of inter increased energy consumption in the launcher. Um, and that does, however, obey uh, economies of scale. Okay, one more question. Do you include anything like Moore's law for technology development on the efficiency for transmitting data versus mass? For example, delaying launch to develop technology? <clears throat> well, no, I don't believe there is a Moore's law for transmission. Uh, we, there are, of course, innovations that can be made at the physical layer, such as uh, quantum entanglement and things of that sort that are being investigated. But if we use a conventional style of optical communication, such as NASA is using in their uh, interplanetary uh, system that's going up, if we use those kind of conventional approaches, which is what we've assumed here, uh, the we're operating very close to theoretical limits. Uh, so there's no there's no additional efficiencies to be had there. But that affects basically the ratio of uh, received energy, which is what I emphasize here, to the number of bits. That ratio is affected by uh, the efficiency of the communication. Unfortunately, there's no magic bullets for making that more efficient. Thank you. David, thanks very much.